Okay, uh, welcome to the boutique talk. Uh, my name is Andrew Sadamchik. A few words about myself. Uh, I used to be a web objects developer in my past life, more than 10 years ago. I started a bunch of open source projects in the web object space. Uh, some of them are still in use in wall leaf somewhere like deep inside. And um, I, I still do write lots of open source code, uh, uh, such as Cayenne, uh, Linkrest, and um, a few other projects. And uh, we will be talking about one of these projects to, uh, right now. And I run a, a company called Object Style. This is an awesome company that uh, uh, can help you uh, with uh, your applications. You know, once you're, uh, you, you, you decide to go into the Java world and you know, you're no longer using web objects, or we can discuss actually like things like rewriting the work components and so on. So talk to me about that you know, after the presentation. And as you see, uh, you know, I uh, write lots of code on GitHub, and uh, December was, was a month when I actually started to write uh, very much code, like, uh, uh, like really a lot of code on GitHub, and this coincided with the start of a boutique project. Um, so just to put things in, in, uh, in the context, uh, so before I start talking about boutique, I just want to compare the timelines of uh, web objects and uh, enterprise Java, which was called J2E and uh, uh, now called Java EE. Uh, and you know, the, you know this part, right? And I'm starting arbitrarily in 1998. This is the year when I actually started uh, using web, web objects and working as a professional programmer. Uh, you know, uh, it, was, uh, it was at its peak at that time, I think. And from there, unfortunately, it was mostly down. Uh, and uh, again, I'm talking about Apple's web objects. Of course, you know, there was Wonders, there was open source community. And, uh, you know, in 2016, we got some interesting information that, you know, nobody could have guessed, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, so before we start talking about Java EE, so before I, I show the timeline for that, uh, there's an inter interesting slide. There's a petition going on on change.org right now asking Oracle to pay attention to Java EE, to actually start, you know, resume contributing to Java EE. It turns out they stopped uh, sometime like last October, and this is the chart showing, uh, I think, uh, like uh, uh, Jira tickets, uh, you know, how many tickets Oracle closed, and uh, it went to zero. Uh, so Java EE sort of, you know, it, it reminds me of something <laughs> many years ago. <laughs> uh, and uh, yeah, this petition right now, it's, uh, it, it strives to reach uh, like uh, 2,500 uh, uh, signatures. Right now, I think it's about 1,700. Um, so uh, there are people who actually care about Java EE. Uh, I, I am no longer one of those people, and uh, I'll explain why. So the enterprise Java timeline, you know, within that period, that Wojcik was sort of just kind of uh, sitting there. Uh, it, w it, w it went through uh, its own ups and downs, and uh, you know, it, 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 1998 was the year when EGB got announced, and uh, you know, this sort of uh, uh, this was a preview of the things to come. Uh, so it sort of it's, it positioned Java Enterprise as uh, something very heavy, something that uh, you know you need uh, this uh, huge container, and it led to the uh, this age of empires, what they call, so like all the vendor, all, all the container vendors uh, just uh, competing for their customers. And of course, this was a huge market, if you know, like JBoss was sold for something like $350 million. Um, so there was a market, but I mean, uh, the product itself, uh, it left much to be desired compared to web objects, uh, you know, EGBs, it was a joke. I mean, I, I don't know, like uh, lots of people used it, but I'm not sure if they ever delivered anything on that. Um, especially entity beans, of course, and everything else was just, you know, just uh, sort of, you know, it was dragging everybody down. Um, but the good thing and, and the big difference between web objects and the Java enterprise was that the open source community, it had a lot of influence there. Uh, and uh, authors of those specifications, uh, many of those, uh, you know, th they worked. Uh, they worked on Apache projects. Some of the reference implementations, such as Tomcat, I mean, they, it's an Apache project. Uh, so uh, community had a say in that, 
And uh, even if the Java community process, uh, the official way of actually influencing those specifications, if it was uh, you know too hard for, for like regular developers to participate in and uh, too formalistic and so on, uh, I mean there were lots of frameworks out there that were, that worked perfectly with uh, Java E's and uh, you know uh, t there was an open source answer to EGBs and it, this was uh, the uh, open source ORM such as Cayenne and Hibernate. Um, uh, and uh, then, like Spring Framework and dependency injection, this was this was an, an answer to all this like monolithic containers, and uh, you know it just shows that the idea of managed objects, managed services is actually a valid one. But you know you don't need a container for that; you can just do it right in your application. Uh, so uh, the, the the whole uh, theme, the whole. Um, a uh, set of specifications that comprise Java E, it, it evolved, it actually started evolving in the right direction at some point. Uh, but uh, it, there was still one thing that held everything together, uh, and uh, this was containers. So this thing was kind of unchanged, even though the containers got much leaner. Uh, it was, it was uh, you know, it became much easier to run your applications in container. And uh, right now, I think it's, uh, the containers are actually very small and very lean, and, and uh, you know, they don't start uh, 25 services and like, occupy a, bu a bunch of ports on your machine uh, uh, and you know, take uh, five, five minutes to boot. Uh, however, I think uh, right now we're at a point, and this is why I, uh, what I'm, uh, this is why I said you know, I, I no longer care about Java Enterprise as this overarching Things that combines those like dozens of technologies is that uh, that thing that was holding it together is was the idea of a container. So a container is a place where all those technologies live and and give an environment for your application. And I feel that containers are obsolete now, and uh, they are not uh, you know uh, they are legacy technology uh, that that is no longer useful. Uh, there's really no trade-off of you know. Uh, when you leave a container and start uh, doing a containerless de deploy uh, development and deployment, you really don't don't lose anything. So there's no there's, there's no downside really, but uh, that, that still remains uh, you know a central part of uh, Java Enterprise. So I guess uh, th that's the reason why this petition actually, even though I'm sure there are like millions of installations of uh, Java E servers and so on. I mean it only gathered like about 2,000 signatures right now. Uh, and again, that's a respectable number, but uh, I would have expected it to be better uh, and bigger than that. So, uh, as far as uh, Java Enterprise is concerned, uh, my problem with it is containers. And uh, this is something like, uh, how many of you actually deploy web objects applications in a uh, in web container as opposed to Java Monitor? So, nobody does? Okay, so some people try it, I guess. Okay, and uh, so that sort of that also shows that you know uh, this infrastructure wasn't wasn't attractive back then. It it is much less attractive these days because uh, you know I, I I'm looking at a container as uh, as as a way of uh, sort of virtualizing the environment for your applications. So um, people in the Java world they used to say that you know they are writing apps, and an app is a WAR file usually or an ER file. And, uh, but WAR file is not an application. You cannot run WAR file. So it's more like a plugin. So think of it as, you know, container is your application and uh, you're writing plugins. Uh, and uh, so nobody thought about it that way, but uh, these days it kind of became painfully obvi obvious to everyone suddenly. And I think there are a few, a few things that, um, uh, that, that happened that actually made it obvious. And one of them is, uh, you know, ubiquitous uh, virtualization of uh, hardware um, operating systems. Uh, so we have uh, virtualization, we have containerization, Docker, right? So uh, uh, Java containers trying to be that vir virtualization solution to actually, like, you know, partition your uh, expensive server resources to multiple applications. Uh, this is no longer applicable because uh, you can do it much easier with uh, virtual machines, for instance, or Docker, for instance. So, so what's left in the container is just 
I don't know, nothing really. And but, but you still need to do the deployment. You still need to assemble, you know, war file and send it somewhere and install all those containers. And people started also doing the second thing. People started doing microservices. And uh, while I dislike the word because it applies to like uh, anything really and nothing in particular, and it just uh, makes for all kind of insane decisions uh, uh, when people design their systems. I mean, there's something behind it, uh, and uh, you know, the the, the thought. Um, you know, the rational part of it is is that uh, you need to partition your system somehow, and big monolithic systems are, are not sustainable. Uh, but, uh, you know, right now the, uh, it became fashionable to do lots of small apps, and it's, it's really hard to do lots of small apps with containers, because for each of those small apps, you need to deploy a whole cluster of containers, uh, and then you need to uh, then you need to push your apps, you need to assemble your wars and deploy them. Uh, so that's, a re that's an extra step. That's also an extra step in development. So uh, whenever you need to run something, and I spent like 10 years writing uh, something like a Jetty launcher, so essentially trying to provide a convenient environment for me in Eclipse to uh, launch those web apps without actually doing a deployment. Uh, so uh, containers, they just get in the way, and uh, you know, this is an unneeded piece of infrastructure. So that, that whole movement of uh, away from containers, uh, I was trying to coin a term for that, and uh, I came some with this like, long thing, what you see is what you run, with your war, uh, kind of like what you see is what you get, right? So uh, it's the same idea here, because container essentially it obfuscates uh, the operating system around you. So uh, when you remove it, uh, you write commands. So in Java, suddenly you start writing uh, just programs, applications. Uh, so you're no longer writing plugins. So you interact with um, with your operating system. You can parse command line. You know, uh, surprisingly, that, that this is like really exciting. <laughs> so uh, there are there are a few ways of doing that, and of course, you know, it all comes down to a main method. So if you have a main method, uh, you're an application. If you don't, uh, you're a plugin, and and. Um, uh, you still need the parts that were in the container. So the container provided you, um, you know, some engine, for instance, if it's a web application, so, so something like a war adapter, right? So a, a, a pool of threads that will take, your, take requests from sockets and, uh, you know, send to your servlets. Uh, you still need that. Uh, it doesn't have to be in a separate container. It can be right in your application. So you need to uh, rip it out of container and uh, put it in your app. And that's actually very easy. All these technologies are there. Like Jetty, for instance, it's embeddable. Recently, Tomcat was made embeddable, even though it's not as easy to include in your app. And uh, then we come down to how do we, how do we actually package all that? And uh, you can package it differently. You can forward its worse. You can do a war, right? Uh, so you can just put a bunch of uh, jar files in there, and you have, you have a main method uh, there somewhere that will be called through a script from a war. Uh, but uh, one popular way is to put everything in an all-inclusive fat jar, uh, and there are tools available to do it very easily in Maven and uh, other build frameworks. Uh, so you have this jar that, that is really a command, it's really an application. So finally, uh, you're no longer writing wars, you're, writing, you're producing jars, and you deploy your jars, and uh, you don't need containers. So they, they are with your words, they work the same way from your IDE, they work the same way from your command line locally, and they work the same way in production. So there's no, you don't need to like squint and uh, you know, think like, okay, so I'm running Jetty here, but it goes to WebSphere, and you know, it's a different environment, so how, how will it behave? Uh, in this case, it behaves the same way everywhere. Uh, so this brings us to Boutique. Uh, we call it minimally opinionated app launcher and integration technology, kind of like a long definition, but uh, it has all the important words. Uh, integration technology is uh, important because uh, just imagine how many things you have in your application, uh, how many different libraries and third-party um, uh, frameworks and so on and so forth. So you need to put them together, and for that, Boutique, Boutique is built on top of Google Juice. And, um, uh, the objects com community is somewhat familiar. I guess some people are familiar uh, with Jews from War Inject. There was an effort to bring dependency injection to web objects, but for technical reasons, uh, you know, it's not as easy to do. Uh, so in Boutique, it's built on dependency injection from, from the start. And also, you know, we have a modularity system, so dependency injection is about injecting individual objects. 
and um, uh, we also have a mechanism for assembling modules, also built on Google Juice, but with some extensions uh, that allows you to assemble your application out of bigger modules. Um, it's, a, it's an app launcher, so it gives you, uh, gives you easy API to interact with the command line. Uh, so your app looks like a POSIX app, like an LS command, or I don't know, anything you might think of from Unix. Uh, and it's minimally opinionated in a sense that, uh, like, for instance, compared with WebObjects. WebObjects framework, uh, you know, it is highly opinionated. It, it tells you, you know, you can run this type of applications with WebObjects. So it, it will always have an ORM, it will always have a work component framework, you cannot take them out. Well, I guess you can with some decompilation and so on, but uh, this wasn't the design idea. In Boutique, we just have this minimal launcher and everything else is a module, even like login system is a module, uh, you know, your uh, Jetty, uh, like server attention is a module, and you can either add it or you, you don't have to add it, so you add only the modules that you care about. So that's uh, um, Boutique history, yeah, it's, it's a new project. Uh, we started developing it in December, uh, it's a collaboration between uh, my company, Object Style, and the National Hockey League, uh, and uh, we uh, we open sourced it under Apache license, and it is successfully successfully used at the NHL for uh, all kinds of applications, from you know front-facing applications to um, what, you, what you call like business back office apps. And uh, it has already proven itself, you know, as a great platform. It's, it simplifies everything, simplifies development, streamlines your development cycle, uh, and uh, deployment. I'd say also. So, you know, our deployment became different because we no longer needed to put containers in certain places. So we just send jars around. But operating on those jars is so much easier right now. So, let's do a demo. Let's do some live coding. Hopefully, everything goes smoothly. Okay, I'll start with Eclipse. I'm actually working on ideas these days, but I, I thought Eclipse will be more familiar. Um, we'll start a new Maven project and uh, call it a BQ, BQ demo. So it's an empty project with one, one class that has a main method, hello world, so let's clean that up a little bit. Okay, one thing that we need to do is, by default, Eclipse creates uh, Java 5 projects. We need a Java 8, so Boutique requires Java 8, and I think that's a good thing. It uh, doesn't leave you any excuse to use old Java. So in our Maven, we say that we are on Java 8. We remove unit tests. And by the way, Boutique is great for unit tests, it's just that in this demo, we don't have enough time for that. Okay, so we're on Java 8 now. Uh, we'll start, so the demo plan is we will start with a uh, simple, also like kind of a hello world application. So how do you start a boutique app with nothing in it? Uh, then, then we'll proceed and build a simple web service. Uh, since, you know, we all want to build microservices, right? Uh, after that, uh, we will add some Cayenne. So we'll show how to integrate Cayenne in a boutique application. And um, after that, we'll add link rest on top of it. So we'll just keep building the application. And, you know, at the end, we will end up with a REST service that actually does something that works with database. Um, so let's, let's start with the simple thing. So we need a boutique dependency. And uh, since Boutique is made of uh, many, many mo uh, different modules, uh, I don't want to remember all the versions of those modules. And uh, of course, you know, uh, different versions of modules, they require specific versions of other modules. So I'm including something called BOM. Since not many people here know about Maven here, so BOM is a bill of materials. So essentially it's just, uh, uh, it's an import that only in lists versions of other modules. By itself, it does not bring anything to the project, but in just a list of compatible versions. So that I, when I import dependencies on, on those modules, I don't need to mention their version. And uh, we'll, include, um, we'll include Boutique Core. 
that provides boutique runtime and actually boutique core module. So it, our first module will be inside boutique. And now we will we will run our app. Also not unlike web objects, so we just call boutique and call a static app method args run. So that's our minimal boutique application. Let's see if we can run that. Okay, it, it doesn't have any, any logic, it doesn't have any code, but it already starts, and uh, by default, just like any other boutique application, it prints what it can do. So by default, it prints help, which is useful, you know, when we send a jar to our ops, for instance, you know, they can always run it and see uh, what this app is capable of and what is it about. Uh, so here it can only print help and it can take a config file, uh, which is unsurprising because uh, we, we don't have, we haven't written any code. So the next step is to turn it into a REST service. And uh, for that we will use a boutique module called boutique jersey. So we keep adding modules. Do boutique jersey. It imports uh, Jax REST specification, so essentially it's, um, uh, you know, we can, we can write pretty standard Java uh, REST services. Uh, let's write our endpoint straight here as an inner class. Public static class, call it API. So it's our web API. We annotate it with JAXRS path annotation, and we, we create one method that responds to a GET request. Okay, pass requires actually path. And just to be to, to, to be build a clean web service, we say that it produces a certain media type, and this would be initially plain text. Text plain. Okay, so that's our hello world phase two. Yep. Yep. Okay, so we have this endpoint. How to make it live? How to how to expose it? Uh, so now I'm going to demonstrate how modules work. So we turn our app into a module, and that's uh, very often what you would do. So your application is your entry point is usually a module and integrates some services that your application needs, or communicates with other modules, the upstream modules, and we will do the later. So uh, we will. Okay, it implements module, and module comes from Google Juice. And uh, module, as you see, it's in red, so it requires a method, a method called configure. And in configure, what we will do is we will contribute our API endpoint to Boutique Jersey module. And uh, this is something that uh, people sometimes don't understand about Boutique, uh, you know, people who are not familiar with Juice, for instance. Uh, so, if you have a module that does something generic, uh, such as you know running servlets or running uh, REST endpoints, but it doesn't know about, it doesn't have any endpoints, right, to run. It only has a framework to do to, to run them. So, a way to provide this module with information with the objects to operate upon is via so-called contribution. So, we are going to contribute to Jersey module, and we are, and uh, it defines a bunch of contribute methods, static methods. So we have a choice here, and we can see what we can contribute, potentially. So we contribute resources, and from here, it's Google Juice API, which I, I wish it was a little shorter. So we contribute resources. So resources is our API class, right? So resources is the endpoint. So we do API class. So now our Jersey module knows about our endpoint. And uh, one last thing. Actually, two. One thing is we need to add our app module. So it needs to it needs to be in boutique runtime, but we also need to add all the other modules. So Jersey module, which internally depends on the JD module, and you know uh, the whole thing. So I could have just added them just like that by enumerating them, uh, but this is just too much trouble. Instead, I will do auto load module. So it will auto load everything that's here in the palm. And all the modules, these modules depend upon. 
And uh, if you're wondering why I can't you use autoloading with the app module, uh, module requires a bit more work to actually expose itself as a module. So if it's not exposed, it's not, uh, you know, uh, auto load. It's not auto loadable, but you can always load it explicitly. So let's run it. Okay. As you see now, we uh, our output has changed. First of all, there's some uh, complaints about login, and we'll fix them in a second. And and another thing is we have a new command, and uh, we got this new command for free. We just imported the module, and that module defines a command. It, what happens really? It contributes it to boutique module, so it's the same contribution idea. So in your module, you can write your own commands. Uh, so we have the server command, and you know by looking at this, it's obvious how to run your server. Uh, but before we do that, let us actually fix fix the login. Uh, like I said, Boutique is not opinionated, so we don't tell you wh which login framework to use, uh, but we actually provide one, which is optional. It's called Logback, so it's integration of uh, Logback framework. That, that's a login framework written by the original authors of Log4j. So they split from the Apache project, and you know they did SLF4j, and then they did Logback. So Logback, Logback is... Uh, is a nice modern login framework similar to Log4j. Uh, if you like Log4j, you can write a similar module for yourself. And uh, so, and it will work the same way. Okay, so the, the errors are gone. So Logback actually took over the SLF logger, and uh, uh, you know now it will be in charge. Now let's go to our command line options and actually use use the flag as we were told. So now we run it. We have our web application. As you see, it didn't exit. It's still running. Uh, it says something about port 8080. In the new version of Boutique, actually, you know, we also print the full URL, so it, it's more explicit about you know, uh, the place, you know, how you can access this web application. But here you can see that it's port 8080. We, we can probably hit that. And I have it in my... OK, so it worked. You know, it's very exciting. Hello, boutique. <laughs> okay, so our uh, simplistic web service, uh, as you see, you know, this is how much code it takes. Uh, this is our POM, so essentially that's, that's the dependencies. And uh, we don't even need boutique dependency anymore because it's, uh, uh, in, it's imported through boutique jersey already. Uh, so it's it's very easy to write write a web service that does nothing. Um, now let's try to write a web service that actually does something, and uh, we'll integrate Cayenne into that. So um, I have a little database running on Docker here, uh, and uh, in the Cayenne tradition, it's uh, it's a database about uh, you know art uh, art galleries, art exhibits. Uh, so it's a very simple database, and uh, we will. Um, for, for a second, uh, change the topic from boutique to how to do uh, Cayenne database first uh, project. And uh, so this is very similar to what you give a showing, except that I won't be using the modeler to do reverse engineering. Uh, I, will, I will use uh, I'll use Maven. I will do it from command line, and there are benefits to that. You know, because everything is automated, everything is synchronized, and um, and for that, we will need to first let's actually open Cayenne Modeler and create an empty project. So Cayenne Modeler is still needed, but in a limited role. So we create a project, we create a data map with it, uh, within it, and we, we specify our default Java package uh, where we want to see our persistent classes. Oops. So we have that, and we save it back to our mm, we save it back to our project, which is still missing the resource folder. Let me create that folder. Resources. So that's the Maven standard layout, and uh, let's add it here. New source folder. Okay, so he, he, here we have our Cayenne project files. Right now they're empty. Uh, now we'll add dependencies on Cayenne, 
and we will we will set up a database first uh, reverse engineering approach. And uh, since since we're dealing with Maven, um, it's actually you know plugin configuration is pretty big. So we configure Cayenne plugin. And the important parts, of course, you know this. Uh, so we specify the driver, we specify where the reverse engineering should go and where the data map is, uh, username, password, which are usually, you know, you don't place them in the palm normally. Uh, you just substitute them to variables and you, you define those variables in your shell. And this is our database running on Docker. And uh, automa automatically we will execute a CGEN task. CGEN synchronizes Cayenne model with Java classes. So this is a simple operation doesn't require a database connection, so we can actually run it with every build. Uh, the other operation, CDB import, this is synchronization of database with Cayenne XML file. Uh, it will not run automatically because, you know, uh, not every environment where we want to build a jar will actually have a database, so we don't want that. We will run it when we need it from command line. And uh, let me actually add at other dependencies, so we add a MySQL driver because we will need to connect to MySQL when we have our app, and um, we need to add, add another boutique module. So, unsurprisingly, we have a module for Cayenne that imports Cayenne and uh, actually manages lifecycle, manages server runtimes that we've seen already. So we imported that. Uh, so this includes Cayenne 4.0 M3. And uh, we included the driver. And now let's uh, experiment with reverse engineering. Command, just like everything in Maven, it's, it's, not, it's not short. So let's go to our project. OK, BQ demo. Yeah, we're in the right place. And now we run this thing. I'll show this command again in a second. So this is a command. You probably don't see it. OK. Uh, so we specify the full plugin name, and at the end we say colon cdb import. Uh, so this is our tool, and you can alias it in, uh, I don't know, in your Unix shell, uh, to something shorter. But uh, this is a command that uh, allows you to pull the current schema and merge it into your, into your data map. And of course it was easy when, we, when our data map was uh, empty. Uh, but it actually works when it's not empty, so it, it's it's pretty smart to synchronize uh, database without overriding your object layer changes. So if you have, uh, if if we go to the da database and, and uh, if we go to the model or other, uh, actually here it is. So this result and it actually flattens some tables automatically. Um, so here, if we go and start renaming some attributes and then something changes in the database and we r run this process again, it will not destroy our customization. So it, it is designed to be incremental. Okay, but for now, we are interested in boutique applications. So let's, let's execute the second step, uh, the CGen part, so generation of classes. And for that, we just do MVN clean compile. Uh, that's an easier command to remember. And as you see, there's some class generation happened here. And it's also lazy, so if I rerun it, it will not run because the model is unchanged. So it's, uh, it's fast and lazy. Uh, now we can refresh our project through Maven, whatever reason. Uh, so, so we have our generation gap. We have our superclasses and subclasses for each entity. Uh, so now we can actually start using them. How do we use Cayenne from, from a boutique application? In web objects, we would go to the session, right, and get our context. In, uh, uh, in uh, non-web objects applications, you decide on your own what is the scope of your context. It's not necessarily session bound or whatever. Uh, and um, the way you get access to that is via dependency injection. So we finally uh, get in some benefit of dependency injection. I mean, we, we, dependency injection was already working for us, you know, in the in the background by assembling this REST application. But now we will do it explicitly, and uh, we inject actually server runtime. So this runtime, and we use inject. And there are a few inject annotations. You see, there are like three different inject annotations. So we use the first one from Google. Okay, because Cayenne also has an inject annotation that works within Cayenne. 
Okay, so we injected the runtime, and uh, now we can actually get all, all the artists from the database and uh, turn them into a list of artist names, for instance. So, and here I'll show, um, Yugi showed you uh, a select, uh, um, select query uh, API. I will show a newer fluent uh, object select. Object select, it's also, it's type safe and it's a really nice one-liner. Okay, artist is missing, need to add that. We, we won't get fancy with the like qualifiers or anything, we just get the entire contents of the table, all the objects. Uh, we do select, and we do runtime, new context. Contexts are cheap, so you know we create it every time, don't care to cache it. And now we need to convert it into a stream, and here comes Java 8, right? So we can do stream, we can do map, so functional programming in action. Artist get name, and we collect that. So out of a stream of artists, we create a stream of artist names, and out of that, we create a single stream. Collect, join in, okay, let it be line break. Okay, let me actually, so that's our, it's our whole query in one line, just with some wrapping. Okay, let's let's run this application. This actually required quite a bit of setup, but hopefully it works. So we started it again. We go here, we reload. Boom, something failed. Okay, let's see what failed. Uh, of course, we there was nowhere in our application where we specified how to connect to the database. And we could have done that in the modeler, like uh, Yugi was showing, but uh, you know, since we're thinking about deployment and uh, we know that you know, our admins, they're not gonna unpack the jar and like, search for, for an XML file where to put uh, you know, the password and the, and, and the connection stream. Uh, here, I'm going to demonstrate boutique configuration feature. And we've seen that any time we started, to, you know, any time we saw the help, you know, the application helps that it printed, there was always a config flag. Uh, you might have been wondering, like, what is, it, what is that about? So any boutique application, it, uh, at the core, it has, like, one of the core concepts is configuration. And by default, configuration is done in YAML, but it can be done in JSON. Uh, it can actually be done with shell variables for what it's worth. So as an admin, you know, you would specify all your passwords and shell variables, and boutique will pick them up based on a naming convention. Uh, but uh, it's easier to visualize everything as YAML because that's a tree-like tree structure, right? So, and once you visualize that, you can think, okay, so if I need to put it in a variable, so I can take this pass from YAML and convert it into a variable name. Uh, so we, we're gonna write, uh, we're gonna write this configuration file. Oops, no, that's not the one that I wanted. Code test. YML, and Eclipse doesn't want to edit it, so it popped up in the external editor. And uh, since I don't want to type all that, so here's configuration. And uh, the roots of configuration um, file, uh, here we see, we see we have two roots, like JDBC and Cayenne, and usually they are aligned with the modules. I mean, they don't have to be, so a module can have 10 configuration roots, but uh, with all the standard modules, we usually have just one configuration root, I guess with, with a few exceptions. Uh, so JDBC corresponds to a JDBC module, so we are building our, our configuration by just uh, saying that, okay, so there will be this BQ demo data source in JDBC, and it's available to other modules. And Cayenne module references that. Uh, you know, it says that I will use a data source called BQ demo. And uh, we're taking some shortcuts, like for instance here, we don't need to specify the driver because it's guessed from the URL, and you know, it's uh, trying to keep it short. Even though the um, configuration of the data source, it takes maybe, I don't know, maybe 50 different parameters, like, you know, this uh, pool size and all the kind of things, like validation query, uh, it's, uh, it can get really involved, or it can be very simple. Uh, so let's, let's use this minimal configuration. So we go back to the command line, and we do config test YAML. 
And uh, here we are referencing the configuration as a file, but it can be a URL, actually. Uh, so imagine you are deployed on Amazon, for instance, and you send your application, and uh, you, know, you need to expand the scale of your cluster, and uh, you always like, start and stop new instances all the time, so you cannot m manually manage that. Uh, what you do in this case, you build a configuration service. You build an endpoint that serves uh, you know, this YAML or JSON. And uh, when application starts, you just pass the URL of that service, and application connects to that service and gets configuration, and uh, suddenly it knows where it is. It knows that it's in QA or it's in production, and you know, it knows what, what to do. And this is a central point to configure the entire app. Even those are like layers, and of course you can, you know, you can minim minimize the amount of configuration you actually change between you know, environment to environment. But uh, uh, you know, the basic mechanism is, is the same. Uh, you have uh, this configuration resource that you can reference. And here we are referencing a file in the current directory. I need to stop the app and run it again. OK, so now it says something about GDBC. And actually, this is, this is not from Boutique. So it, it sounds alarming, but it's not. We just need to suppress this message. It's stupid. Uh, this is from the connection pool implementation. Uh, so now when we go to our app and reload, we actually got some results. Uh, so we got this one-liner that, that turned into a Cayenne query uh, that was turned into a string in our code, and uh, we have this uh, silly little web service. So the next step, so now we have persistence. Now we have REST API. Now we want to make this REST API useful to people, useful to maybe front ends that people are writing. Uh, so we go, uh, we go to our POM and we add link REST. So as you see, we are uh, keep adding stuff. And actually, if you start with link REST, you probably don't need any of that because it imports everything except for logback. But here it sort of demonstrates how many things are there. Link REST. And uh, link rest does not require um, uh, juice injection because link rest operates within the uh, within JAX RS specification, which has its own way to inject the environment into your endpoints. So here we will use um, we'll use a context annotation, and we will inject an object called configuration. And this is a JAX RS thing. Of course, you know, there are many different configurations in different contexts. So this is JAX, uh, JAVAX WS RS core configuration. And this helps us to, to access link rest. And this also means that our endpoint is not boutique dependent. It's only, it only depends on JAX RS and link rest. So we, we change the return type to data response. So that's a, a link rest thing. artist, and we do link rest, select artist, config, and we need to pass another parameter. So link rest understands what actually was requested, because uh, the client has uh, a lot of freedom to you know, get as much or as little data. Uh, we add another context variable. I could have actually made it a... Uh, an instance variable, but we'll pass it as a parameter called URI info. So the, that's a JAXRS thing. We pass it to link rest, and we do select. So that's our whole link rest service. It's actually less code than it uh, than it was with our simple Cayenne example, but it does much more. Uh, so let's let's start that, and hopefully it does not require any extra configuration. So it just runs. Oh, we got one other thing. So we're still returning text plane, which is, uh, it would have worked actually, but uh, you know we we want real JSON. Okay, now it's better. So we'll go here and reload, and uh, we have the same list of artists. Uh, as JSON in a link REST format, uh, so it's already like easier to consume by your JavaScript client. It already has IDs and all that stuff. But uh, this is link REST, so we can do we can do more. We can do limit 
So we can we can do include exclude. So we can include a relationship here. So we can we can see you know not just artists but also artists with uh, related paintings. And uh, this is all the client decision. So the server just gives whatever clients ask for. So that's just like Aaron said. Uh, that's your new query language. Um, And you gotta say that again too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was I was just saying you gotta show everyone that again because I think you blew past most of us that you you basically did the object graph. You did like yes. key, key value coding with link with with rest. I, I think I think that's worth just doing again. Just just repeat it. Yeah. So uh, we started with just a root entity which was artist and uh, artist entity in our Cayenne model has a relationship to paintings. So so we can do include paintings, so it adds paintings. Uh, we can also do include exhibits, so we, we get more information there. And uh, the client decides, and the server, so the goal of the server here becomes is to actually be a gatekeeper and just not allow the client to request the entire database. Uh, but, uh, you know, if the, if the server doesn't care, I mean, uh, that's all the code you need to write. So the code that I, I just, sh uh, you know, that, that was shown. Uh, and of course, you know, LinkRest can do updates as well. It's just that you know it takes less time to do to do gets to demo gets because I need to I don't need to drop the command line and like write some curl queries. Um, uh, but you can, of course. I mean, it's not just a it's not just for reading data. Uh, so that's your graph, and uh, we can remove the limit. Oops. So we got a little more data, so here we, we show in, and actually, you see how the limit works? So it says there are six objects, and I do limit limit two or three. It's still six objects, but only three of them are in the collection, so this helps with pagination, of course, because you know how many objects are in the collection, and uh, you only get in the small window out of the entire collection. Um, so very easy to implement pagination on top of that. And then you can do filtering and so on and so forth, and sorting. Um, okay, so this was our uh, like code demo. Now, one last thing with the demo is how do we package that? So, how do we how do we actually deploy all this all, all, all this stuff? And I, I was talking about uh, about uh, fed jars, jars with dependencies. Uh, so, we're going to build one of those, and for that, we need to go to Maven and add another block of code. Uh, Luckily, it's not it's not that big. Okay. So essentially, uh, the packaging and boutique uh, again, boutique itself is agnostic to packaging. You can package it in any way you want. I mean, really, you can create a bunch of jars and just reference them with a class pass on the command line if you want to. But it's so this uh, runnable jar is just a convenience. But uh, most of our jars are actually packaged this way, and. Um, uh, to do that, we use a standard Maven plugin. I don't even need to declare it as a group, so it's a standard Maven scene, Maven shade plugin. Uh, but it requires a little bit of configuration. And for that, uh, you can either do it yourself or you can impose a parent POM on your POM, uh, even though, you know, and generally I recommend actually going inside this boutique parent and like copy paste it in your, your own POM because you don't want a framework superclass, right? And the same thing with POMs. But here, we just imported all the configuration from there, and we can, we can actually do packaging. And the end, clean package. So you see here, it just it takes a bunch of jars. That's, that's all our, our dependencies. You see how many? And um, it put them all in one jar file. And we do less L target. And as you see, the original jar, so it was renamed to original BQ demo, and it's very small, it's 10K. And then we, we have this uh, bigger jar. It's actually, it's not that huge. I mean, our wars were, were bigger, I'd say. So it's uh, 17 mags, uh, which includes Boutique, Linkrest, JaxRS, Jetty, uh, you know, MySQL driver, what else? Like many, many different things, like Jota Time, 
uh, Jackson serializer. And uh, so 17 megabytes is not that bad. Now we can, we can actually run it to see if it's uh, truly wheezy war. So we run it without arguments. OK, something is missing. So no main manifest attribute. We need to tell it where the main class is. Of course. So we go to our properties, and the property is called main class. And this property is defined in the parent, so it's, this property is coming from here. And we're thinking about actually building our own tools that actually can guess which, which class is the main class. Uh, so this should be it. We'll repackage it. And we run it. So as you see, if you run it without arguments, same thing as an Eclipse, it just prints, uh, prints help. And uh, now we do server, we do config, test, YAML, and we get our, our web application, we get our web service. So we come, come back here and we reload, it works. And uh, you know, it prints all the requests here. And since Cayenne is not caching, we are running a query every time. So this is, uh, this is the application in the packaged form. It's just one file. So I think it's pretty cool. Uh, so that concludes the demo. And uh, we go to the slides. So at the core of boutique application are modules, configuration, and commands. Modules, these are the modules that we've, uh, we've already built. And, uh, you know, this morning, I started on another module called Boutique Swagger. Uh, this is a, a way to document your REST API, so that's also another thing that people are requesting. And we also have it, uh, I already put it on the slide. We just recently, we got a tapestry module. Uh, so we, we have lots of good things, like we have modules to run jobs, for instance. And uh, it's much better to run jobs from like command line applications uh, than to run them, you know, from web applications that people used to do just because they had a container, because you know they had a hammer, they thought everything is a nail. Uh, so uh, we, we've seen Jersey JD, and we have Jersey client, for instance. It, it it works as an HTTP client. It goes and it supports various types of authentication, so you can like load I don't know Twitter feeds or something. Uh, so we have Liquibase. This is used for database migrations as you evolve your schema. Uh, so you can use, you can write little Java apps that actually migrate your database from version one to version two. Uh, and we used to do that with uh, uh, with custom shell scripts before. And I mean, Liquibase was always there, of course, but you know, it was another tool to learn and everything. So now it's packaged in boutique, so it just becomes another jar that you run. So all the migrations are inside the jar. Um, very useful. Metrics, so that helps to monitor like what's hap what happens in your application. So like when you start Jetty, for instance, you can actually instead of Jetty, you can use Jetty Instrumented. We have another module that in includes metrics, and you know it's it uh, it can send some statistics about your running server to your monitoring system. Um, we have a link move there that we'll be talking about tomorrow. Also a nice tool. Of course, we have Cayenne, um, and we have other things. And uh, if you Remember, the project only started in December, and uh, we have all these modules. What does it mean? It means writing a module is very simple. So if you have the underlying technology and you just want to integrate it in Boutique, uh, all you do is uh, provide, you know, you, you just put the services, uh, you know, you just expose certain things from that framework to your, your application via dependency injection, and uh, you figure out how, to, how this framework starts. So you provide this, like, startup life cycle. You hide it in Boutique so that your users don't need to think about it. And your users just include the module, and they automatically get this, uh, you know, presumably very important service. And uh, all the configuration is taken out. You know, different frameworks they configure themselves in many different ways. So, you know, uh, like Log4j, or you know, if you compare it with JD or with something else, I mean, each one of them it has its own way to configure itself, and Boutique unifies that. So we will talk about configuration in a moment. So configuration. We've seen this YAML file, and like I said, it doesn't have to be YAML, but YAML is a good model. So it's a, it's a, it's a good representation of what this configuration tree is all about. But then you can uh, rip it into pieces, and like you know, you can put some configuration inside the app as a default, and then you can provide just 
pieces of that uh, in, like, say, QA and production environment, and you can override pieces of that with, uh, uh, with variables. So essentially, YAML is uh, it's a nested structure similar to nested properties, for instance. Like in web objects, you would use properties. So you can imagine, you know, properties. Uh, you know, if you unflatten that dot 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 passes, you can imagine them as trees, and you know that's your YAML. So what happens to it when uh, boutique starts and it loads configuration? So it doesn't load the entire. It loads configuration as a JSON tree. Actually, it keeps it internally as a JSON tree. But uh, you know, whenever you want to use it, it creates uh, creates an object for you. So you don't work with a, with a map of properties. You don't. And uh, this is a big improvement because you can actually validate your configuration now, and you don't need to do, uh, you know, like integer parse uh, parse int from string and then catch a number format exception. Um, so you get a real object that can have real behavior, that can have validation, and finally, you, all these objects are not just objects; they usually serve as factories. And uh, this is a very good pattern because. Uh, essentially, it separates creation of some services. So you, you can imagine a service like server runtime in Cayenne. It needs to be configured, and you know it has some life cycle when it starts. Uh, and you don't want to put all this information in, uh, and all this logic inside uh, the object itself. So like separate object creation and object use. Uh, so Factory provides a mechanism to s create those complex, potentially complex objects uh, by using configuration that came to us from YAML and other sources. Uh, and by, you know, um, in the factory method, you can actually pass some other services that, that come from other modules, for instance. So, for instance, we, we might pass a, uh, we have something called shutdown manager. That's a service that, that's available to anyone in boutique. So when the application co comes down, you know, it, it, it allows all the services to, like, close their connections and do whatever. Um, so uh, configuration goes into factories. And uh, now commands and options. Uh, this is what this is what what makes uh, Java applications into something that uh, you know they were not before, and very few people actually write Java applications that actually make sense to a Unix person. Uh, even like Sun and Oracle, you know, they inherited, I guess, or, you know, that from Sun. Like if you look at uh, things like Qtool or, or even Java itself, I mean, you know, they, they all use some kind of like weird conventions for like switches and uh, command line switches and stuff. So we, we by default use a f uh, framework that provides POSIX flags, uh, but this is also pluggable, so you can override that strategy if you want to go, you know, do your own style. Uh, that's doable. Testing with JUnit, uh, boutique is is actually very uh, a very cool testing framework. It turned out we we sort of suspected that, but we uh, we never knew how you know successful it will be for us because uh, what it does it allows to start all those scenes that previously required a container. Uh, it, it it allows us to start like the real applications that listens on the port within the test and actually pass. First of all, so you have like a, a number of uh, things that you can change to build your test matrix. First of all, you can like pass pass different modules to your startup, so uh, you can create this like uh, part of your application, recreate a part of your application that, for instance, serves REST resources, but also checks security. And we actually do that. We we start like you know like three like REST services that co co cooperate with each other, all within a single J unit test, because you know some of them provide security and some of them actually provide data, for instance. Um, so you can assemble this pretty complex system right within your JUnit test, and uh, JUnit, with the help of Boutique, will manage that for you. So essentially, it's like uh, we have this rule annotation that comes from JUnit, and it provides some lifecycle, and we integrate that into things like JT Test Factory. That's just one example. So that's uh, that's a test framework from a JT module, but we have test frameworks, you know, from other modules that help with those modules, and we have like a generic one in Boutique that allows you to assemble everything from from your set of modules from scratch. And, uh, you know, we have this, all, all, the, all this cool code that actually waits for the service to start. If it didn't start, like, in, I don't know, however many seconds, uh, you know, the test fails. Uh, so it, it allows you to control all that very easily. So now, you know, it's a little comparison with boutique, boutique and web objects, and uh, it's, not, it's not about, like, you know, what's better or what's worse. It's, it's, it's more about just to give a perspective, I guess. And, uh, you know, both boutique and web objects are with the war in the sense that, uh, you know, you don't deploy web objects to, to JBoss unless you really want to. Uh, so you actually run it as an app. Even though it's packaged differently, it's not packaged in a jar. Uh, you, you still have, you know, there's, some, there's still a binary sitting somewhere that starts Java. 
or script. Uh, in web objects, uh, modularity, like high level modularity, is achieved with frameworks. Uh, in boutique, we have modules, and uh, modules are better than frameworks because uh, you know they're not uh, they're not static. There's nothing static in there, so you can you can do things like you can start multiple boutique apps within within a unit test. Like try this with, with web objects. Um, but uh, at the end, uh, but but there's, there's still you know the scene about. Uh, this high level modularity, which is kind of important, so essentially it allows you to just uh, you know drop a bunch of modules and have and have a, a running app essentially and just fill in a few blanks uh, of course, boutique is hundred percent open source uh, we are trying to be unopinionated, so there's of course you know this uh, layer in the bottom that uh, you know requires Google juice and uh, I guess one or two libraries that uh, that are still there, and uh, they, they may cause conflicts with something else that you import. But uh, all this is uh, uh, really minimal. You can you can manage you can manage all that. I mean, but beyond that that you can add anything to boutique. You can you can build any type of application. And we use independency injection, of course, and we have this uh, nice object-oriented configuration uh, that goes a long way to actually you know. Uh, explain how to run your app and uh, actually allow you to control what's what's going on all the parts so what apps it's good for it's good for any kind of apps to me uh, I guess some people will disagree somebody will probably find a good use case for Java e containers but I don't uh, I like the one in the middle apps you distribute to your users uh, I don't know if you tried like sending the web war files to uh, uh, to, to the customer without, you know, and, and tells them to deploy without your assistance. And the same thing is kind of problematic with war files as well. Like in the Java E world, uh, you would send a war, and, uh, you know, in theory it's easy. You just put it in a container, but in practice, uh, you know, the receiving end, they will need to figure out how, how, how to configure it. There's no unified way. So essentially, you need to, very often, you need to unpack it and go, go inside the war file, find a config file, and change something and pack it back. And then you need to start a container. You need to figure out which services this war needs. So you need to deploy them on container, like data sources. And then it turns out that they don't support this particular container, uh, which G Java E was presumably supposed to address. Uh, you know, uh, cross compatibility, but uh, it re it's really not that easy. So with boutique, you ship a jar file and, and you ship like a YAML file with like a bunch of things commented with you know just information like what this property means. And they go change the YAML and uh, they they run your jar. Um, I'm, I know I'm out of time and uh, I'm getting uh, we're approaching the end. So should we attempt to port uh, war to boutique? And um, actually, I tried it. Uh, I, I gave it a try, and uh, uh, in theory, it's possible. But uh, we need somebody on board who really like deep into NS bundle and stuff. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so uh, it's, it's it's doable. I, I'm I'm not sure if you actually win by anything by doing that though, because you, you will still have uh, you know war runtime. So you will trick it somehow and you you will like provide uh, an alternative bootstrap sequence. Uh, but uh, still you know you will have all those static singletons and stuff. You won't be running. You you, st you still won't be able to run like unit tests. I'm sure, or it will be like really hard and slow. Uh, so to me, it's it's just uh, you know. It's just going against the flow for no apparent benefit. So Boutique is just a good platform if you want to try something outside of web objects. And I think that's a good platform for uh, for anyone who wants to try something in Java uh, you know, without rewriting everything they have. So you, you say, for instance, you want to write a new job. Like uh, I'm not sure how, how you guys were running like uh, you know periodic jobs in web objects. Uh, if you were at all, uh, so you would put probably it in a WAR application, right? And just put some scheduler in there. Uh, so here you can just uh, you know do a standalone scene, and uh, you know it will be a small jar that runs from Chrome or you know its own scheduler just runs like a daemon, so there's no port it listens to. So uh, it's a regular application essentially. So it's a good thing to try new things in Java, I'd say. Uh, and uh, one scenario where it would make sense to use boutiques web objects is if you know we actually uh, we actually do port the WAR component. To Java to just you know do uh, do a clean room implementation of the WAR framework you know on top of Cayenne, then you know we can easily create this boutique module around WAR component and make it make it easy to add to our app. And uh, like like I said last week, I added tapestry and you know that's the same level of complexity. It took me I don't know 
one day. Uh, so, and, and anyways, this is my opinion. If, if somebody actually wants to try, you know, I'll, I'll be there to help, but, you know, I don't want to go deeper to NS bundles than I already did. <laughs> And uh, we, have, we have a few resources here. So we have, we have a nice site, uh, uh, Boutique.io, we have Twitter, and uh, make sure you go to GitHub and Shell Boutique and uh, give us a star on GitHub. It's very important to spread the word and you know, to show people that you know, there's uh, this project out there and somebody's using it. Uh, so thank you very much and I'll be happy to answer questions. Oh, and by the way, I have some T-shirts, uh, not for everyone, but like first come, first serve. <laughs> so T-shirts like this one. <laughs> Just a quick question. Is uh, anyone using uh, Boutique apart from uh, your own company and uh, the NHL? Uh, so, so uh, like I said, Boutique is a new project, but we are starting to build a community, and there are actually some people who are joining from outside who are not uh, affiliated with us in any way. So just people coming from the street, and uh, we, we are seeing that right now. So... It looks like you're doing a lot with the link rest these days. Are you still build, building apps on the server that generate HTML? Uh, like I said, I just ported Tapestry to Boutique, uh, so it means that I will have an app that will need that. But uh, you know, it took us six months to actually you know, have this request, uh, so not too many. On your module slide, I saw an icon that looked like a steampunk hat. What, what module is that? It's right next to the mustache. Okay, I'm trying to remember if that's... Uh, if that's uh, I think it's metrics. Yeah, it's probably metrics, yeah. Metrics. Yeah, that's, okay. that's what it is, yes. You've got, you've got version one of your LinkRest application out there today. And tomorrow you want to make version two. How do you let the users that are using the, the old version kind of die off slowly and then move to the new version with new users? Okay, th th this comes down to, uh, you know, uh, uh, a big uh, con ongoing conversation between, you know, in the REST community about, you know, convenience versus, uh, uh, you know, good design and, uh, uh, and versioning and uh, all, all that stuff. So, uh, essentially, so if you, if, you make, uh, if you make incompatible changes to your model, uh, then you break everything. That's uh, that's it. I mean, and uh, you can probably write, run an older version somehow and see, and, and you know, like uh, create some adapter in the Cayenne layer, like another version, just like totally like fork your code and uh, you know, just run another instance of the service. And it's actually kind of easy with microservices because your applications are smaller and actually they are sort of standalone. Uh, so there are a few approaches, but you need you need to really think about it, and whenever you make a change, you need to think about it. So there may be non-breaking changes. So if you add a column, for instance, and you have a new attribute, that's a non-breaking change. So that's, uh, it's not going to affect anyone. So who, people who understand it, they will, they, they will use it. But if you add like a non-nullable column or whatever, so that, uh, that really makes, makes it hard to, to, to upgrade. Uh, yes, so there's, there's no silver bullet there, but by like, designing everything meticulously and thinking, about, uh, thinking ahead, uh, you can actually achieve, uh, you know, good, good results with versioning by just, you know, providing new versions that are compatible with old versions. And of course, you know, you can version the endpoints. Like for instance, you know, if you, uh, if you add, like, a, if you rename an endpoint, you can do a 301 or whatever. But like, you know, when you get down to the model, when you get to the database model, that's where things break. But because versioning the actual, you know, API like uh, paths, uh, it's 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 easy. I see what you're saying. It's, it's different than what we've been doing in the past. When you're changing it, you're changing the API because all the state for most of these apps are on the clients, whereas in the past, when we're doing an append to response and we page to page, some of the changes we make are UI changes, and that, that doesn't happen anymore with this. It's, it's yeah, I mean, and these changes here, yeah, you can make like uh, 100 UI changes for one backend change. And that's really the ratio that we're seeing. Well, I guess maybe not, maybe like 10 to 1. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, this, this problem, it has a smaller scope. Also, it depends on what type of API you're writing. So if you're writing a public API, if you're a Twitter 
or Facebook, uh, then you really need to apply the best practices that coming from the REST community on uh, how to version APIs and everything. You don't expose that much of a model. You don't expose this graph there, really, I mean, because it's going to break everything. So you, you, you need to start using hypermedia. That's another good approach for, you know, like remapping the endpoints. So where the client can actually look at your response and say, oh, okay, so... Uh, there's a relationship, but it's not replicated there. So I, I don't just, you know, hard coded this, uh, this, uh, all the other endpoints. I only have like an entry point, and from that entry point, by using hypermedia, I can actually find everything that I need. Um, but if you're writing sort of, uh, there's a pattern called uh, backend for front end. So if you're writing a web service just to serve a single client, that uh, and this is the people that are sitting next to you, uh, you can actually version it together, right? So uh, the client that they can keep releasing, and that's how we are set up right now. So the, the clients they can release new versions all the time without effect, affecting the backend, affecting the server, and that's what they do. But whenever a need arises to release something on the server, then they coordinate, they release together. But then, of course, if you have iPhone apps and like you know, you, you need to be more careful. So you're talking a lot about REST interfaces, obviously. What's the latest um, wisdom on authentication and that mm -hmm. in, term, in the REST world? Uh, I mean, it's all, all the old good HTTP things. So you have basic authentication. Uh, you have OAuth 2. Uh, and, uh, you know, we are using SAML, but I don't want to get into that. Uh, so it's... Uh, but uh, re really, I mean, uh, those are the two... Th two simplest things that you can do with REST. And uh, OS2 is, is really flexible in that respect. I mean, you can actually implement some kind of like uh, token system. And uh, it's not even that hard to write your own backend for that. And uh, we've, we've done that on a few occasions, actually. Uh, so you, have, you can write your own OS infrastructure pretty quickly uh, based on some underlying you know, security stores and stuff. Uh, but if you're in, in, in the enterprise, uh, then things become more complicated, and we've done that too. And uh, you know, we we have like frameworks on top of frameworks to, to deal with that. But it may come down to things like Active Directory and stuff. So and uh, then we have a system that abstracts all that because uh, you know we don't want our applications to know about Active Directory. Uh, so we have we use a framework called Apache Shiro uh, that. That is that filter, that abstraction between your application and your real, uh, you know, security backend, and uh, then you can develop locally with some like file of uh, test fake users, and then you can go to production, connect to AD, for instance. Um, so yeah, I mean, it depends on the on your particular case and like what what you have in your company, like what are what are your authentication stores, and then you start building from that. Thanks. 